Welcome to the second session of French Music in America, the 2021 President's Day Conference of the New York City Chapter of the American Guild of Organists. Dr. Andrew Henderson, the chair of the Organ Department of Manhattan School of Music, will present a lecture recital performing French classical organ repertoire today from Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, where he is the director of music. Earlier in the conference, we offered a panel discussion on the influence of the French tradition on contemporary organ building, composition, and performance. And later, Christopher Houlihan will give a recital of French romantic music from St. Bart's Church on Park Avenue. Follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube page, please, for more content. Welcome. And thank you to James Wetzel and his program committee for inviting me to present this lecture recital on the President's Day Conference this year. And also a virtual welcome to Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church here in New York City, where I'm the director of music and organist. The title for today's lecture recital is French Classical Organ Repertoire on the North American Organ. Now, I must profess that I don't feel that I'm exactly an expert in this music, but it is music that I love to play, um, that I love to teach and listen to, um, and have been very interested in studying over the years. Um, and one of the major challenges it, that I alluded to in the title is the challenge of playing this music on the North American organ, um, on an organ that, for which none of this music was written, um, and you have to think really about its context, the initial context. Um, my focus really isn't going to be on the technical side. Um, I really could probably spend a fair bit of time talking about things like um, rhythmic inequality or the note inégal, the sort of the way you might change uh, the note, uh, the way you play strings of notes, or ornamentation, which could go on for some time as well. I'm really going to be concerned with things like sound and sort of overall style um, and sort of ways of making this music work on a 20th, 20th 21st century instrument. And when we talk about French classical organ repertoire, we're really looking at the years from about 1660 until about 1750 or so, um, called the sort of Grand Siècle, the great um, century. Um, and actually looking at the repertoire we're playing today, it's really from about 1690 to 1710, so it's really an even narrower uh, sort of uh, view of music. And some of the composer's names are relatively widely known today, people especially like Francois Couperin. Um, but there are a lot of composers that mostly organists know today. Um, people that I'll be demonstrating today include uh, Clarembault, uh, Nicolas de Grigny, uh, Jacques Boivin, and there are many other names, Dacan, Dandrieu, um, and other uh, composers of this period. But they're not really known quite so much outside the realm of organ music. Um, and nearly all of the organ music consists of relatively short pieces, and they were meant to be played in the liturgy of the church. Um, they were meant to alternate with sung music, with chant. Um, usually there would be a choir down front near the altar of the church that would sing portions of the chant, and then there would be a response from the organist, usually at the back of the church, uh, in the organ loft, who would play versets or versets um, in place of the chant. And so there'd be what is called this musical football that would go back between the front of the church and the back of the church all throughout a mass um, or uh, vespers or whatever uh, service the organist was playing. And this is called alternatum, basically alternating between chant and organ music. Some of the pieces are in fact longer. Um, they were meant to cover more liturgical action like the offertory or the offertoire. Um, another one is the elevation, when the host or the monstrance was elevated and everyone in the church could see. Um, that also usually required more playing to cover the action at that point. And so there are some longer pieces as well. Um, and some of the pieces are actually based on chant uh, or hymns. And so there's a specific liturgical connection, a specific religious connection. However, most of it really is secular. I mean, you can look at it and you don't see anything particularly religious about it. Some of it even refers to sort of um, other sort of popular genres of the time, like sort of lyrical music um, to be sung or also dance. And so you see all these elements sometimes all mixing together uh, in the context of the same organ book. 
And I suspect if you were to somehow get yourself back to um, 18th century Paris or the uh, other major localities in France at the time, and you heard the organ played, you probably would have heard the organist improvise. Um, I don't think they would have played very much written down music at the time. However, uh, luckily for us, many of these great organists actually wrote down some pieces, whether they were improvisations originally, or they decided to hone their compositional craft and put them down in paper. Um, we simply have them. And they would put these things together, um, sometimes as mass settings, sometimes as little suites, uh, sometimes as a set of hymn, uh, sort of uh, chant and hymn variations or versets um, for different liturgical uh, situations. And also they were or often organized in the modes or tones of the church. And there were eight modes, and sometimes there would be a book of eight different sets of versets to base whatever the, the chant happened to be uh, that particular day and what key area or relationship needed to be involved. Um, and most of these publications included prefaces. Um, they were, the organists of the time were really very prescriptive about many things. Um, unlike, for instance, Germany, where you almost never saw um, the composers actually write down lots of uh, specific directions. Um, and the organists would talk a lot about how to play their music, and usually from fairly general things, too. Um, I have here a facsimile of an original edition uh, from 1665. It's the first organ book by Guillaume Gabriel Niver. Um, so we have this wonderful front page, and then on this page, but it's like a title page talking about what you'll find in the book, um, and then some interesting things about the tones of the church, uh, some descriptions on how you should perform it, um, even little things about fingering. Uh, we've got more things here about um, ornamentation and how you uh, should play, and also um, the stops you should use, and so sort of basically sort of the ideas of um, that particular composer. Um, and then it ends here uh, with the first piece that shows up, uh, and it goes from there. So we have um, these prefaces from various organists um, that give us hi really historical snapshot of how to play these pieces. Um, I like to tell my students that it's also around this time that cookbooks also start to appear in France. Um, and so maybe there was this general cultural move to sort of writing down your ideas or sort of capturing your ideas so that you can, you know, I guess promote your ideas. Um, however, uh, you actually see an awful lot of similarity if you look at all of the different recipe books, you might call them, uh, from different composers. Um, just as you might sort of see in, in cooking, uh, you probably could recognize the dish. It'd be, you know, you, it'd be sort of very straightforward, but then each chef might prepare it a slightly different way um, with different ingredients, and also different regions might have different ways of preparing a certain dish. Um, I think the same thing really very much applies to the organ music here as well. Um, and so when it comes down to it, um, there is also a great deal of adaptability. Um, it's not like it was all sort of rule books. Um, they would often just sort of say, well, you have to suit it to the instrument you're playing or what you're doing at the time. Um, so you have to sort of use your own sort of the bon goût, or your sort of your good taste uh, to eventually make it work. Um, with very few exceptions, I think that if you wanted to hear a typical French classical organ, uh, you would have to leave North America. There are only a few. Um, that have been sort of built very much in that specific style. Um, and even if you went to France, you wouldn't find very many original examples in their original condition. There have also been some others that have been built along those lines. Um, so you really have to use your ears. And of course, there are lots of wonderful recordings of these historical instruments um, in hard copy, but also just all over the internet. Uh, so I think you can get the sound into your ear, and the hope is that you can kind of use your taste to find the best sound on the instrument you're playing. And so my plan today is to look at six different types of pieces uh, and to look at the styles and types of registrations um, that are inferred by their titles and to look at some examples about how you might approach it on an instrument um, of today. Um, the first one is called the plein jeu. And if you opened pretty much any collection of organ music from the time, the first piece you would find was probably a plein jeu, or sometimes also called the prelude. The name plein jeu refers to a particular kind of registration. Um, plein means full, and so, or also could mean complete. And so basically you're using the complete principal chorus that was available to you at the time. If you had an organ with 16 foot uh, pitches, um, you would use the 16, and you would use the 8 foot uh, principal, the 4 foot, 2 foot, 
uh, a mixture or two mixtures if there happened to be two. Um, if you had a two manual organ, you would couple the other manual to that. And so you would put all of the principal choruses together to create this sort of sheen of sound, um, a very full and at the same time bright, but also uh, brilliant, but never overly shrill. Um, most of these pieces are for manuals only. Um, but there are some pieces, and in fact I'll demonstrate in a moment, pieces that involve also a pedal part, and uh, pedal parts that usually uh, would quote the chant that the piece was based on. Um, and also just a quick word about the pedal divisions at the time. They had very few stops. Uh, they usually had a very loud trumpet that would help you make that chant um, obvious in the pedal part. They also sometimes had some soft flutes that can be used in some uh, softer registrations where you needed to use your feet to provide the bass. But generally, there were never 16 foot stops and sort of low bass sounds in the pedal itself. If you wanted that, you would have to couple it down from the grand orgue or the great, the main division. Um, most of these pieces are fairly homophonic, uh, also somewhat contrapuntal. They always usually have very good voice leading and I think are fairly serious in nature. Um, and all these composers who published uh, prefaces and talked about their pieces also talked about ways you should play them. And so I've got um, just a couple of examples here. Um, so uh, Nicolas Lebeg said, you should play it very slowly. André Raison said, it should be played slowly. The chords should be quite legato one to the other, taking pains not to raise one finger until the other has pressed down and the last measure should be much prolonged. Some others say it should be played majestically on the Grand Orgue. Another one said it must be played unpretentiously and with a full effect, provided one knows how to provide a full texture for fast passages and practically no trills, especially on 16-foot organs. Another said it should be treated seriously and majestically. It should be played in large harmonic sweeps interwoven with syncopation, dissonant chords, suspensions, and striking harmonic surprises, and may all that, however, form a regular measured rhythmic flow. And so now I'll demonstrate a plan jeu, a typical one of the time. This is by Nicolas de Grigny. It is the first verset or verset of his Kyrie from the Livre d'Orgue. The next type of organ piece I'd like to look at today is the fugue. The fugues at this time were normally played just with the hands, just with the manuals and not involving the pedals. There was, however, one major exception, and that is Nicolas de Grigny, who wrote his fugues in five voices. There were two voices for the right hand, two voices for the left hand on a different manual, and then a voice for the feet 
However, that was the exception and not the rule. And so most of uh, these fugues were played simply by the manuals only. There were two types of fugues. There was the fugue grave, or the serious fugue, and the fugue gay, or the happy fugue. Most of them fall under the latter category. One composer of the period, Gaspard Corret, said that the fugues should be played slowly and with great attention to detail. The registrations that survive in the organist's preface of the time are almost all reed-based. They frequently mention the trumpet or trumpet stop should be used. That was usually found on the grand organ. It was the loudest and sort of brightest reed stop on the organ. The cramorn, which would be located on the positif manual, was another one. You might consider the cramorn sort of a clarinet with an attitude, a fairly brash sounding reed um, that could also be used to play these fugues. However, you wouldn't just use the reed stop by itself. The composers of this time, the organists who wrote these prefaces, talked almost all about adding other stops to reinforce the reeds. Uh, they would often call it its foundation. They would add usually one or two ranks of pipes to go along with it, uh, not to change its character, but simply to reinforce it. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but I think the conjecture is that reed stops can sometimes be fairly cantankerous. There can be some unevenness in speech, and it simply would help to sort of regulate the sound uh, from bottom to top. And so I'll demonstrate just a little bit uh, how this works. Here is a trompet on the swell division here, and I'll play it just a little bit by itself. I'll add to it the eight foot flute a chemine and the octave, just reinforcing that sound. So it doesn't really change the character very much, it just sort of reinforces it. And so that's what they talked about in terms of adding a foundation to sort of stabilize the sound just a little bit. And so I would like to play a fugue by Francois Couperin from his Messe pour les couvents, the Mass from the convents. The next piece that I would like to concentrate on today is called the duo. As its name implies, it is for two different voices, one to be played by the right hand on one manual, one to be played by the left hand on another manual. So there are two contrasting sounds. Although there are, there are various choices, most of our 18th century organists agree on the registration. Basically two cornet sounds, one for the right hand, one for the left hand. And the left hand, if you had a 16 foot pitch, you would use it. So there were two contrasting sounds, a lower one on the left hand and the regular cornet on the right. As a matter of review, um, the cornet registration is made up of five different pitches that you would mix together. Uh, the first is an eight-foot flute. The next is a four-foot, usually a prestant or principal. Add to that the nazard, a two and two-third foot pitch. 
a two foot, usually a principal. And finally, the tierce at one and three fifths foot pitch. And those five voices combine to make up a cornet. And so you would have a cornet in the right hand, and according to these composers, you would have a cornet in the left hand played on the grand org. If you had a 16 foot borden, you would use it. And also, if you had a fairly rare stop, at least rare for us in North America, a three and one fifth foot gross tiers. Uh, which is basically a tiers but playing an octave lower, um, which is a really unusual, very characterful sound um, if you have a chance to hear it that way. Um, and so uh, that was one way of playing it, and it seems to have been very common uh, between all the composers. However, um, not every instrument has uh, two different cornet sounds on two different manuals. We're actually fairly lucky here at Madison Avenue. We actually do have one on the choir division and one on the grate, and so I can separate them out fairly well. Uh, but if you don't have it, the composers of the time did mention that you could substitute the left hand for an eight-foot reed, like a trumpet, uh, with its foundation. So you at least had some contrast between the right hand and the left hand, and that seems to work perfectly well for them as well. Uh, the composers also talked about how you should play these pieces. So here are some examples of, from the prefaces of the time. Monsieur Lebeg said you should play the duo very boldly and lightly. And others said the duo is a free and easy style of piece. It's played rapidly and pointedly when written in eighths. Another said boldly and lightly. Another one mentioned you should play it lively and very gay, performed within the tempo. And so to give you an example of a duo, I'm going to play one from the uh, Livre d'Orgue by Jacques Boivin. The next example of a piece from the French classical organ literature that I'd like to play today is the basse de trompette, basically the bass of the trumpet. It's a very interesting kind of piece, actually. Um, it, it, the left hand plays uh, the melody on the trumpet, and it's a very acrobatic kind of sound. Usually they're very active, um, almost like it's channeling a very active gamba or cello part. Um, the piece I'm going to demonstrate this piece today is actually by Clarembault, and he provided some um, interesting uh, differences in this piece compared to some others. It's called the basse et des yeux de trompette, the bass and the top, or the, the soprano voice of the trumpet in the low and high registers that plays alternately between the left and the right hand, um, which I think really provides a very interesting uh, contrast. However, he also gave the option, if you had a third manual, to use another stop for the right hand. You could use the cornet separé, which would be a bold five-rank cornet that would live usually on the Récy manual or the third manual, um, and it would also provide a nice contrast between the sounds. But I think it's important to emphasize at this point that the organist did give, give you options. You know, if your organ had more possibilities for color, you should do it. Um, if you had a small instrument, they would give you options of finding substitutes. And so various composers left instructions as to how to play the basse de trompette. And here are some examples uh, from the period. The basse de trompette should be played heartily. It should be played boldly and neatly with vitality and spark. Others said it should be played very boldly. 
Another one said, performed daringly, imitating a fanfare. Just as with the fugue, uh, if you're going to be using a reed stop, you should fortify it um, with its foundation, usually with an eight-foot flute uh, or a four-foot prestant or both. Um, and so reinforcing its character without changing its character. Um, and although Clarenbol did suggest a contrast in the two sounds, I'm actually going to use the same trumpet stop for both the right and left hand solos with the um, accompanying sounds on something called the jeu doux, the soft stops. Different composers had different recipes for that. Uh, sometimes they said it was the eight foot borden and the four foot prestant. They also might give you um, the montre and the borden, two eight foot sounds together. Basically, it had needed to be something along the lines of being neutral so that the solo stop could still be heard prominently against the accompaniment. So I'm going to play now uh, from the Lieve d'Org by Louis Nicolas Clarembault, the Bass et des Eaux de Trompette. The next type of piece that I'd like to demonstrate today is entirely unique to France. And in fact, we can even pinpoint its creation. Its creator was the organist Nicolas Lebeigue, who was a renowned organist in his day and a renowned teacher, and also one of the organists of the King of France. The word tie, spelled T-A-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, can be translated to the word middle in English. It also can be the word waste uh, in French. And so the solo voice appears in the middle of the texture. And in most cases, it's played by the left hand, while the right hand and the feet, the pedals, uh, would provide the accompaniment. So the left hand has the tune. The most common sounds for these uh, pieces on tie are the tierce on tie and also the crumhorn on tie, two different solo sounds. Um, the solo registration uses five different pitch levels of the tierce on tie of the cornet which I talked about just a few minutes ago, eight, four, two, two, third, two, and one and three fifth. However, um, the organist of the time also advocated for adding one additional stop to that, the one and one third foot stop, the larigo or the quint. Um, now, unfortunately, many organs, particularly in North America, don't have all those stops on the same manual. Um, I am lucky here at Madison Avenue, I do have all the stops. You just have to compile them just a little bit. Um, on the choir division, I have my complete cornet. I'll just build that from the bottom. And I'll add to that the larigo from the swell division. I'll play a note and then I'll add it so you can hear a little, little difference in character. So basically it's reinforcing the nazar but an octave higher. 
And so the tiers on tie um, isn't simply just the cornet or tiers registration. Um, if you do have an instrument that has a one and one third foot stop, um, and you can use it in the registration with the cornet, uh, you should. Um, I think it does add a little bit of extra spice to the sound uh, coming through in that middle of the texture. Now the stops to use for accompanying the voices uh, tend to range quite a lot between the different prefaces. Um, there are many different suggestions. Here are some of them. Uh, one of them is using a 16-foot borden, 8-foot borden, with a 4-foot preston. Another one suggests uh, an 8-foot montra and an 8-foot borden together. Um, the 4-foot preston makes its way into a number of these registrations, but I find that here is where the similarity between a French classical organ and a typical North American instrument really tends to uh, fall down. Uh, the forefoot principles I find on most modern organs are much brighter um, and slightly more aggressive than they really were um, in the French classical period. And so trying to do exactly what they said in the prefaces doesn't quite work in our context and I think grabs too much of your attention. Um, so actually, the way I'm going to demonstrate a tier sans tie in a moment is by using the boudin and also the corps de chamois or gemshorn on the great division on this organ, uh, which I think makes a very nice, uh, very neutral and warm sound for an accompaniment. We also have some performance instructions as to how to play these pieces. And here are a few of the examples. In fact, Monsieur Lebeg, uh, for whom this is uh, likely his creation, he said, you should play this kind of piece seriously. To my mind, this type of verset is the most beautiful and distinctive of all organ pieces. Some other examples of how you should play it, the tiers on tie is to be played straightforwardly and fluently. Another composer says to play it slowly. Another one says it demands languidness and nuance. And sweeping passages full of movement. And finally, Don Bedos in the late 18th century says, the tiers on tie must be very song-like and ornamented with great taste. Some organists just trill from one end of the keyboard to the other, much too fast, full of passage work and cadences, all this without, being, uh, without having a lyrical effect. This does not result in a true récit or song or song-like style, for the melody must be made to sing. So I will play for you the tiers en taille from Couperin's Messe pour les Coulevants, the Mass for the Convents. Hopefully not the way Don Bedos said some organists play it, with trills from one end of the keyboard to the other, but with a certain amount of variety and also lyrically as well. <laughs> 
you may recall that at the beginning of my discussion, I was talking about the plein jeu, or the full sound, which is almost always the first in a set of pieces from this period. The grand jeu is the type of piece that usually concludes the type of the verset. Um, and just to clarify, the plein jeu is based on the principal chorus, the principal with the mixtures, with sixteens, it was usually homophonic and fairly contrapuntal in nature, and usually on the serious side. The grand jeu is the total opposite. It is usually far more effervescent. Oftentimes it's grand and majestic, sometimes it's dance-like, and it does not use the principal sounds, it use, uses the reeds and the accompanying cornets um, and sort of foundations that will in incorporate the reeds um, into the sound. And oftentimes uh, many of the composers wrote lots of echo effects into this, where if you had a three or four manual instrument, um, and you had cornet sounds or other reeds on other manuals, you could produce all these interesting echo effects. And so there are quite a few unusual and interesting pieces that survive from this period that use different manuals in the grand jeu, or different chœur, or different choirs of reeds, uh, bouncing back and forth between each other. Um, as I mentioned, the stops involved here are the reeds on the manuals. So on the grand orgue, you would have the trumpet and the clairon if you had a four-foot reed. On the positif, you would have a crumhorn and you would normally couple them together. So they would both be played on the grand org and you'd have a very full reedy sound. Um, also, you would use the foundations for those reeds. As I mentioned earlier, you didn't just use them by themselves. Uh, you would use, say, the bourdon and the prestant just to kind of reinforce it a little bit and create some um, sort of stability in the sound. Um, in addition to that, you would also use the cornet stops or, or the cornet um, composé where you'd add the cornet stops together. And the reason for that is that reed stops usually get a bit thinner as you go from the bottom register toward the top. And so I'll demonstrate that just a little bit with a trumpet by itself in a couple of different ranges. It does get a little bit thinner as you go to the top. If I add a cornet of five stops to that, it helps level it out just a little bit and actually help increase the volume as you go up to the top. And if you add to that, say, the clairon, uh, the four-foot reed, and also the um, foundation from the swell here, you'll get a fairly nice full sound. It's also important to realize that at this time, it was very rare for there to be a 16-foot reed available on the instrument. Um, the 16-foot bombard, as they became uh, known throughout the 18th century, was very rare, certainly in the period of pieces that I'm playing, demonstrating today. Um, and I think that if you do use it, you have to use it um, really very carefully, that it doesn't take over quite so much. I often find that the tessitura of these pieces, particularly at the ends of them, tend to be fairly in the middle of the keyboard or, or even in the lower part of the keyboard, and therefore a 16-foot reed really kind of gets a little bit too snarly and opaque. Um, so, I think they can be used um, sparingly and just very carefully. Um, particularly, perhaps, I'll often add a 16-foot reed uh, at the end of a piece just for a sort of a final splash. Um, but essentially, you have to be very careful about that. And so, um, I would like to demonstrate the grand jeu, the reedy sound that often concludes all of these uh, compilations of pieces of Versailles, um, with a piece by Jacques Boivin called A Deux Coeurs for two choirs, or two different choirs of reed stops. So I'll be using the choir division with its reeds, and the great division with its reeds, and trading back and forth. 
finally, to conclude this exploration of French classical organ repertoire that we could play on the North American organ, I'd like to think about how these pieces can be used today. I think we would be extremely hard pressed to find a Catholic church or any church really that does alternatum practice uh, every week, week in, week out. Um, it's probably hardly ever done at all. Um, the idea of having chant alternating with organ music and the organ music actually sub subsuming the words, you're not hearing them sung, the organist is simply sort of replacing uh, pieces of chant and also text uh, from that particular service. Um, I think it's a very unusual thing to find. And so the case is what to do. Um, basically you have all these chains of fairly short pieces. And one way that I do like to do it, uh, use, use them, is to create little suites uh, for a prelude or for a recital. Um, picking a particular composer, if you're interested in it, um, you can find a couple of different movements that seem to work well together, perhaps from the same tone, uh, where you can demonstrate different sounds. Uh, one of the great things about these short pieces is that they are very colorful and characterful. And I think that you can kind of create a suite of, say, four or five pieces. Sometimes I'll do that in the context of a prelude on a Sunday morning. And then perhaps play one of the longer pieces, uh, like an offertoire, um, as a postlude. So you've got bookends, a few shorter pieces in the prelude, and a loud piece at the end. Um, this also, of course, can be done in recitals. I often, in recital, like to play a couple of shorter pieces, just for sort of breaking up some lo larger, louder works, where you can show off some really interesting characters, sounds on the organ. So I hope that you have enjoyed today's presentation. Certainly you can be in contact with me. We'll post my email address at the end of this. If you have any questions about this repertoire that you think I might be able to answer, I would be most grateful to do so. So thank you very much for joining us for this year's President's Day and for this afternoon's lecture recital.